All right, welcome everyone. Thank you uh, for coming to Ruth Reese's Artist Talk uh, as part of the Teen Museum Studies program. Uh, my name is Brandon Barr. I am the Teen and Adult Programs Manager here at CAM. And I run like the NAN programs, LEAP, and then of course Teen Museum Studies. Uh, so this is my second go around for Teen Museum Studies. Uh, and it was a, again a really awesome experience. Um, so for those who aren't fully familiar with the program itself, um, how the, the way Teen Museum Studies works is we get a group of middle high school students that come in and they essentially curate, well jury, curate, and organize an entire show uh, which happens upstairs in the gallery space right up there. You can kind of see like the little tentacles off the side of the door. Uh, and I kind of stand back and like watch this happen. Uh, and it's a really cool experience uh, because I just kind of help guide and I don't have to like do all the heavy lifting because they kind of do it themselves. Um, but it's all, each year so far has been like blown away by the way they set it up because once they start the during process, they take control of that. So they'll decide how they want to do it. Uh, I'll throw out a quick like, okay, now we gotta move on to this part, and then before I know it, the whole group is already like deciding what they wanna do, how they're gonna do it, and it's great. Uh, this year was really cool because we got to do three virtual studio visits with the top three candidates, uh, which was great to kind of have that closer connection with the artists and learn more about their process, their materials, things like that. And then after that we had, once we made the final decision, which of course ended up being Ruth Reese, uh, Ruth invited us to her studio. So we got a really cool opportunity to seeing all of her work laid out, these like in progress works. Uh, the students came with questions prepared. We even discussed like layouts and like how they can do install the work. Um, and it was just an awesome experience again to kind of like see that all the way through and to have these like hands on moments. Uh, so let me go ahead. Um, I'm going to have the moderators. Uh, if you want to quickly introduce yourselves, name, pronoun, school, age. Is this on? Okay. Wait, is this working? Is I it think working? So. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Maline. I'm in the 12th grade. My pronouns are she, her. I was one of the curators for Finding Ruth Reese, and yeah. Um, my name is Salem. I go by they, them. I'm in the ninth grade. Um, I'm homeschooled. Hi, my name is Ava Swan. Um, I'm 15 years old. I'm in ninth grade. I go to St. Joseph's Academy, and my pronouns are she, her. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so these are our moderators. They volunteered to, to partake in this and help with the conversation. They had some awesome questions prepared to bring up to Ruth. Uh, I also do, want to do a quick shout out to Dean Diderko. Uh Dean stepped in when I was going on my parental leave and worked with Ruth uh, to develop the awesome installation upstairs uh, and got all the great work organized in like the best possible format. So that was really cool. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead uh, and hand it over to the 2023 Team Museum Studies exhibiting artist, Ruth Reese. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, I do want to go ahead and say thank you to Cam, a gem of St. Louis, um, and everyone in the Teen Museum Studies program. If they are any, in, any indication of our future, it looks bright, um, bringing us insights into culture um, and um, so much wonderful energy. So thank you to, to everyone. Um, they were in charge of a lot. So writing and organizing the curatorial statement, um, helping me edit and uh, organize ideas, um, in-depth conversations about challenging topics that help us explore the work more deeply, and I really can't thank them enough for that. Um, they also helped um, organize all the labels. We had deep discussions about where the work was located, um, how it was hung, um, and, and they really were um, this wonderful mentor and guide to me, actually. So I'm, I'm so excited to be a, that that relationship was so reciprocal. Um, I wanted to go ahead and open the doors. <laughs> um, 
A lot of the work that I am investigating uh, is framed, so to speak, by uh, the idea of what is knowledge. So if you think back to the cabinets of curiosity or the wunderkammer, um, how do we store knowledge? Can no is knowledge only contained to words and language, or can it live inside of image? Can it, can it um, sort of exude from sculpture? Um, and for me, the answer is a resounding yes. So opening the doors. Um, and when we open the doors, I really want to take a look closely into um, the ocean and the sea, which is one of the most expansive um, ideas that we have that can contain symbol. Um, the octopus itself. Um, so this is a species and a being that has been around since the Jurassic area, um, has blue blood and three hearts, um, eight arms that are always moving, um, it almost feeling like it's independent of, of each other arm. It's, each arm has a brain of its own that is able to connect um, sensuously with the world and life around it. Um, to me, this is not only a metaphor for our capacity as humans, but um, definitely a reflection of, of the divine. Um, they are able to change color, uh, take on their surroundings, known for being extremely intelligent, 2,000 suckers on, on each creature. Um, they cannot stand for anything but mystery and, and power. Um, the octopus has been a driving theme for quite a while. So um, we have the one upstairs on the left and one of its earlier brothers and sisters, um, they just keep coming. Um, they're not alone, there's not singly a, an octopus, but is grafted to the human form, very often sort of a feminine satyr of sorts. Um, we have arms that are uh, capped in hands that are making mudras, um, conjuring, so to speak, um, and the, the legs are hooved. So there is this idea of the shadow self uh, creeping in. Um, that must be dealt with. Oh, we have another piece here that was at, was at CAM before on the left, um, and we have a, a, a lovely piece that, um, that is out in the world, um, owned by a friend and a collector. Both of these pieces um, are acknowledging you, the viewer, um, to maybe philosophically dance with them. Those arms are beckoning you to um, engage your own sense of mystery, um, your own sense of limitless potential. Um. <clears throat> Upstairs you'll also see that the ocean doesn't just contain octopi, but perhaps um, figures that represent the ocean itself. Um, that could be everything from Thalassus in Greek mythology to Gaia to um, even Sumerian images. There are a series of, um, a little side note, there are so many statues that are under the ocean and in the water. Um, barnacles are growing on them. They are um, becoming decomposed, yet they are ever present, almost like um, the prayer sculptures of Mesopotamia, constantly in a state of awareness of empathy and compassion and love for us, even though that time is passing all around them. That is something that I, I definitely want to bring into the work, the sense of um, ever-present um, awareness that is aware of our journey as, as humans, as people, um, but is still being consumed by the earth itself. Um, oh, this is the um, Bernie relief, a piece from ancient Mesopotamia. Um, it almost feels uh, relevant um, for concepts that we are engaging today in terms of female divinity. Um, this could be, um, it could be Lilith, it could be um, uh, in Mesopotamia there was a, a goddess of the earth and she had a sister who was from the underworld and um, I like to think of them as both sides of the same coin, um, somehow engaging our potential but also um, what we are coming into. Um, okay. These are some other works um, that pertain to the ocean. Um, and I do think of the octopus and 
any personages that would live in the sea almost as ancestors. Um, I, the one on the right is actually sort of carrying a little child, uh, an octopus being. Um, and the one on the left is Dowager of the Sea. So we have um, almost what I would kind of sense as three generations, like a, a previous, a present, and, and the next. Um, for me, there is this idea of unfolding itself. Um, this is a piece that I, I put in because it feels transitional. Um, we have um, a face emerging from a solid mass that is also simultaneously the pedestal. The head itself is growing um, and reaching and turning into uh, a tree and flowering. A central theme of the work, I think, is um, metamorphosis. It is transfiguration. It is changing and growing. As we change and grow, it feels slow in our daily lives. Um, sometimes it's hard to remember back to like when you were a little person or a baby or um, thinking ahead to when you um, are in the next generation, you're the last layer. Uh, but through sculpture, we can show that change can happen fast. We can um, connect with the idea that as we change our emotions and our stories about ourselves, we're actually changing our sense, essential self. And that can actually be very quick. We don't have a lot of imagery, I feel like, in our world that shows us that change is possible. Change is now, change is, is, is for you and me and, and the culture at large. But this idea of growing into a new skin, of metamorphosis, of being on the threshold, Liminal, wrong direction, okay. Ooh. Um, my background a little bit, I actually have an undergraduate degree in English and I um, can teach K through 12 language and literature. Uh, and so I feel very steeped in stories. Um, and for me, stories unfold, again, not only in words, but in images as well. Um, so I would say, you know, of the two books that I have read or reread in the last year, I would say um, Ovid's Metamorphosis. So he was a Roman poet from around 8 CE, um, writing all about those uh, Greek myths um, about transformation. And here we have Narcissus. And on the right, um, Robert Holdstock. Uh, he talks about stories, um, uh, talks about the potential of stealing them, of holding them, of changing them and growing them, and that all of that is in our birthright. Um, this is a piece uh, upstairs, and it's of Daphne. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Daphne and Apollo. Um, Apollo was ridiculing Cupid, not a good idea, um, <laughs> and saying he wasn't worthy of having an arrow, um, as Apollo is, you know, um, sort of more manly and able to kind of like hold that weapon, I guess. Um, and Cupid was like, I'm not really sure. So Cupid shot Apollo with a arrow of lead. I mean, oh, that's the wrong way. Cupid shot Apollo with an arrow um, with a love on it so that he would fall in love with Daphne. Now, to prove his point, he shot Daphne with an arrow of lead, which caused a feeling of ultimate disgust. So we have Apollo um, tricked into love, enamored, um, but the object of his love will forever be um, repelled by him. So the idea is that he is consumed with a desire. So he is, he's pursuing her through the woods. Um, she is originally a nymph, a sea nymph, and they didn't really distinguish between like the ocean and the river. So. Um, she could call, she was associated with a river. Oceanus would be rivers and oceans. And she called out to her father to change her um, or to save her. And he changes her into the laurel tree. Um, you know, I have this sense that we are all Apollos and we're all Daphne's. We're all chasing, we're all running, um, and we're all calling out. Um, so I feel like we can kind of tap into this metaphor on, on a variety of levels. I also think Ovid 
across 2,000 years is able to talk about, or that we can pull from it, ideas about trauma and response. Um, there's something about being pulled out of your regular, um, what is happening, the routine of the now, and, and exiting for a moment that speaks to shock to some degree, um, and this idea of um, how we handle trauma. Uh, one of the pieces that I've always found influential is Bernini, um, Daphne and Apollo. And you can see here, they're kind of backlit, but her hands are turning into these um, beautiful branches. Uh, I think there's also something about Bernini that is theatrical uh, that I, I really connect with. This is another Daphne. I have several, several Daphnes. Um, <laughs> I love them all. Um, and uh, oddly, you feel compelled to keep making this theme. The theme is feeding me, wondering what it means to transform. Um, these are a couple other influences. They all involve floating heads. <laughs> so we have Aubrey Beardsley, Gustave Moreau, and Odillon Redon um, there. Um, there's this uh, idea of a philosophy that you can kind of tap into that has a life of its own, um, the floating head. I also spend a lot of time in New Orleans, New Orleans, and there is this jungle-like landscape with Spanish moss that is overtaking everything. It's haunting and magical. It's abundant. Um, and while I'll never be able to copy nature or be nature itself, I, I like to invite that sort of um, crawling, devouring abundance into the work. This is a, um, yet another Daphne. Um, this one is not just turning into a tree, but you might see that there is some honeycomb there. Um, and uh, also the eyes are absent, so there's a sense of mask. Um, in all clay is defined by the absence, the interior shape, and how that hollowness invites meaning into it itself. I would call these some influences as well. So we have a Benin mask on the left. Um, we have a Bali mask on the right. This one revolves around the idea of Circe, um, who was uh, a figure, um, probably one of the first what one might call as a witch. She was interested in pharmaca, which would be potions and um, being able to use plants and almost using cooking uh, as a way to create change. Um, she may have created cilia, the giant octopus itself, that would devour sailors. So um, you will notice that she has um, various like plates and dishes that she's holding. Um, the power of of containment and mixing. I also really enjoy looking at old porcelains um, from the Mycenae tradition. They are, have an element of coquetry um, and this sort of exaggerated arm movements. Um, in some sense, I'm really amused and they have a certain silliness to them, but I also like to have my own exaggerated hand movements and bring that. This one is Aphrodite. Um, we have this idea of the goddess of love um, commingling with um, maybe an earlier sculpture of um, Artemis that has multiple volumes suggesting the female form. Uh, so kind of cobbling together um, perhaps different disparate aspects of femininity, but acknowledging the power of both of them. This last piece is the storyteller. Um, I really wanted to land on this piece because I think it's the stories that we tell ourselves through images and art um, that will ultimately allow us a key to happiness, um, a key to evolution in ourselves and our culture. So, thank you. I'd love to turn it over to our moderators for a few questions. Okay, I know that you said some Greek mytho 
mythological creature, creatures inspire some of your pieces. So what mythological creature inspires your artwork the most and why? Well, um, I really do enjoy the Sphinx, um, who has that riddle. Uh, I'm trying to, the Sphinx itself um, asks a riddle and um, is sort of um, asking us to uh, push ourselves a little farther. So it is part beast, it is part animal, it is also sometimes part woman. Um, I, I don't know, I think that that is one of my favorites. Um, you mentioned your title, Metamorphosis. Um, where did you first come up with the idea of metamorphosis through the Greco-Roman stories? Well, Ovid wrote a, um, a series of um, poems in Metamorphosis uh, that kind of tap into our, our quest for change. It also has um, a lot of um, origi origination stories where um, we are actually born from stones, born from the earth, um, and for me that that really resonated because, um, you know, sometimes I ask myself this question or other people ask, does it have to be clay? And I would say, yes, yes it does. Um, it allows us, it allows me to kind of connect with the, the body of the earth itself, um, allows me to have a sense of my own, engage with the, my own mortality um, and think about uh, where, I'm, where I've come from and where I'm going. The actually tactfully handling the clay um, changes, I think, the, the piece itself. I don't think they couldn't be anything besides clay. And I think that really comes from one of the stories in Metamorphosis. Is there anyone around you who you draw inspiration from for your art? Oh my gosh. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, for one, you know, I, my, under, my graduate degree was in sculpture. Um, and we ended up kind of digging clay from the earth and making these um, clay bale houses almost, these structures, these architectures, and embedded them were actually objects of daily life. So embedded in the wall of clay would be like a plate or a clock or um, eating utensils or pictures. Um, and that was a way to kind of connect with um, what is the essence of the clay? How to stop time? Kind of burying it. Um, what is interesting is after I left kind of sculpture um, in namesake, uh, I snuck in the back door of a little studio at St. Louis Community College uh, with Jim Iber and uh, learned the art of clay, learned how to throw, um, began to understand the technique and the medium itself, uh, and completely fell in love with um, the tactile nature of, of being able to build this way. Um, one of the wonderful things about clay is that you do kind of have this sense that you are a part of something from the beginning to the end. You, could, you can go in your backyard, and I've done it with the Girl Scouts, like dig out some clay, mold it, put it in a kiln and come out. And there's not very, so much of our life is pixelated and broke down. And we're only part of a cog of a process. Clay itself is um, something where you can be part of the process from beginning to end, and there is something extremely grounding about that. So while I was there, I definitely fell completely in love with, with clay itself. Um, and I would say um, a part of me grew up in that studio, for sure. Out of all of your pieces, is there a piece you feel most connected to? And if so, why? Ooh. Um, I think that the piece that I'm perpetually most connected to is the one that's going on in the studio like right now. Um, <laughs> you know, to have your hands in the clay, to feel that potential um, to be a creator in your own life, uh, that is where I think this sort of zinging like connection with what is, is going on. Um, after you've made something, you can put it in a slideshow and you can tell people <laughs> show people, but um, 
that, that kind of a living feeling of having your hands in the clay, it's, it's a little bit different. It feels like almost like making all of this was a dream. But when, when you go into the studio, um, that's the most exciting thing that's going on. That's my favorite piece. Um, do you feel the title Metamorphosis you can relate to in your life some way? Oh, for sure. Um, sometimes you, you know you get up every day and you kind of feel like you're going through the same motions. But when I can um, create a, a sensual tentacle, I connect with the sensuality within myself. Um, and that feels really good. Um, if I can make a, <laughs> an, a mouth that is sort of like angry, um, I feel like I can, that is a cathartic experience for me. Um, so I think the idea of change, yes, as I'm making these pieces and res representing change, I feel like I am spending time with that idea on a kind of subconscious level, um, which is why I think art is pretty much essential to being human. Um, it'll allow you to spend time with the ideas. It'll allow you to process um, whatever ideas you need to have come into your own life. And for me, I do feel like I want to be on the edge of something at all, at all the time. If you could tell the youth of your community one thing, what would you tell them? Um, I would say follow. Fall in love with your babies. Whatever you are making, don't hold it up and compare it to somebody else. Don't tell yourself the, the, the negative components. Celebrate it, own it, feel it. Um, those are your babies, and you need to love them and advocate for them. So whatever you're working on, whether it's art or um, you know, uh, a creative endeavor in a engineering, or you know, wherever your creativity is, is being felt, Make sure that you um, honor yourself um, and what you're making at that time. I noticed on some of your pieces that you have a cage or like a box around them. Does that represent anything? Well, I think um, when I think back to the cabinet of curiosities, um, Traditionally, it felt a little a colonial, where you went out and you took something and you put it in your cabinet. <laughs> you kept it there. You owned it. Um, so part of me wants to have open cabinets, um, and I like the idea that knowledge can shift and change, that things can come and go. Um, in the, the Circe went up there, the, she's sort of like, the door is locked. But it, the, the kind of cage aspect is coming open. And, and I do like the idea that structure is important, but it's also important to um, not let it fully contain you. Um, you have to be able to kind of come and go. When did you start feeling um, like that pull like in your sculptures towards like Greco and Roman um, works and stories? and like where they originated from? Well, I think that there's this idea of a myth ago, and that comes from Robert Holtstock, where you have a myth, but it's not static. Um, you have to kind of live it through your own experience, um, and therefore it's alive and unfolding. I think we're all doing that all the time, with various archetypes, um, with various themes within our own life. Um, now, I have a piece that what isn't pictured here, but it was, it was called Nyx, and I had a dream uh, where um, a big happening was going to happen. I was going to have my daughter, and um, I also wanted to kind of hide. So in my dream, this, this being, it, like, that's sort of acknowledged, you know, on some level, I had the sense of Nyx, of night, um, took a blue tarp and, and she moved forward and covered everything. And so I think that um, if you do keep a dream journal or if you do um, allow yourself to zone out, um, to daydream and fantasize um, and to play, uh, I, think, I think actually that's part of our um, human makeup to think about these sort of semi-divinities that, that we're actually might be part of, 
you know, so how to, yeah, I think, I think it's always been there. What was the process of making your sculptures and how long do you think it would take to make one? Oh my goodness. Well, um, when I uh, kind of wrote the application for this, I didn't think I'd get it, but <laughs> I did. And, uh, and then I was like, oh my goodness, I have to make some things. And um, I, you know, honestly, I think it takes like m more than, like, I think it takes like 40 to 60 hours to make a piece, which seems um, ridiculous. Uh, but I think like multiple firings, different processes, um, and the piece has like simmers. It's like on a, it's like in my brain, kind of like processing and um, fermenting. So I think even the hours itself, it, they have to be spaced out. So it has to be like only so many hours this week and then next week. And then there's another idea that it takes your entire life to make a piece. So everything you've ever been through, every skill you've ever had, it's compounding exponentially. And then you're able to make more um, sort of richer pieces. So there's a non-answer for you. <laughs> okay, so are all your pieces connected in some sort of way? Do they all branch off of each other or? I think that I want to make things that are imbued with a with a spirit of sorts. I think that the hollowness of the clay lends itself to that. Um, to me, they are to some degree they're watchers. They're sort of watching us. I don't think that they're void of spirit. I think that um, in the expectation of something being there, that that that, that will meet you halfway. So. Um, to me, I'm trying to kind of almost, every piece is an altar, so like I'm asking something to come there. Um, you know, so I'd say that they're connected because to me it is, a, you know, I, I try to be boisterous and funny and, and I enjoy my time in the studio, but in the end, like, making, there's a sacredness to making, you know, you're, you're invoking to some degree. Um, so I think that's in all the work. I think the idea um, of retelling a story that is actually really, um, honoring your own life, um, retelling a story or a myth or an archetype so that you can walk into it and feel the power of it, that feels really essential. Um, I think I am always questing this idea of change and growth um, and how can I s kind of symbolize out that outside myself so that I can simultaneously process that inwardly. I think there's a fine line between making for yourself and making for a larger community. It's, a, it's an interesting type rope. Um, but both have to be taken into account. So I want to do it for myself, but I also want to do it for anybody who might come across the piece. Um, can they feel that sense of change? Do you think you could ev ever imagine your life without art? Oh, golly, I think it would just push into a different area. I think I'd be like a... <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, art and creativity um, this idea that you are being kind of super sensitive to your intuition about um, what needs to come next um, can can be in almost any, you can be a librarian and it's the way you order books or um, you can be a teacher and it's how you connect with your students. Um, you can be an architect and it's how you build a building. So um, I feel really lucky. I feel like um, Clay and I were meant to be together. <laughs> so I feel like I found my my true love <laughs> in this lifetime. Um, but uh, I do think I, I could have projected that onto something else at the same time. When you're feeling down or have art block and have no inspiration, what do you do to get out of that? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if any of you all um, meditate. Sometimes you go into your like little meditation space and it's like, I'm not feeling it. But like you kind of tell yourself just to be there anyway. Um, and eventually um, a little spark comes. So part of it is um, just making the space for it. Like you have to make date time for your medium. Um, <laughs> I think also um, I read books, but I also really enjoy audiobooks. books. Um, 
if I'm feeling pressured by the blank page, whatever that looks like in ceramics, um, I think kind of the mind is always kind of like needs something to chew on. So if I can get that part of my mind to chew on something else, <laughs> then the sort of intuitive part will kind of step forward. So um, I think there's a fair amount of tricking yourself. You know, tell yourself you can only eat your favorite snack in your studio. <laughs> When you are reading, do those books give you inspiration for your art? Or do you do any research to get more ideas? Um, absolutely. Um, I just finished reading Song of Achilles and um, Circe, uh, both by Madeline Miller, both reinventing um, Greek mythology from a possibly, I'd say, feminist or perspective or a perspective of sort of um, the Hidden Voices, um, and I found all of that extremely inspiring. I do think the politics of those books was really interesting for like my, my I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like a little bit more of my surface mind, um, but it also allowed me to kind of think intuitively um, about various, like Celia who devours the, the sailor, sailors, um, you know, was in, was brought to be by Circe. So what is that? Like a, a you know, a, a strong, a strong woman kind of creates this sort of scene where she's actually wreaking vengeance on someone she's jealous of. And um, I just think that there's a lot of like human drama that I, I can enjoy um, by reading. I did, I did reread Lavendus by Robert Holstock and um, there are some very surreal scenes where time passes um, unnaturally um, and you have this, this being that was made of, it's actually like a wooden tree being that um, decomposes over thousands of years and um, to read that in words, I want to have that actually in the work to look at. So um, I do feel like they go hand in hand. When you were, you sorry, <laughs> when you were younger, could you imagine yourself where you are today? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I definitely wanted to be an art teacher, so yay, check the box. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I yeah, but by today's standards, uh, supposedly I'm middle-aged, so I'm, I'm hoping for a whole new lifetime. What do I want for the next half? I don't know. <laughs> What do you struggle with the most with clay? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, I, you, you have to, I think, learning to listen to the material itself. I may have all these drawings and these sort of very linear thoughts about what's going to happen. Um, and then if I go in and try to superimpose that over the clay itself, the clay is like, uh-uh. Um, so you, what you are doing is you're asking, hey, clay, can we hang out together? Um, will you show me what you can do? And then the clay is like, OK. And then um, is a dance. <laughs> so I think m remembering just that like this is a, actually not only a collaboration. Yeah, it's a collaboration with the material. If you could add another piece to your show, what would it be and what would it represent? Ooh. Um, I've been really intrigued by Medusa. Um, I've been waiting and waiting because um, I think she's been misinterpreted for gen you know, thousands of years, you know. Um, she was she was, you know, violated in a temple um, and then she has this head of snakes and turn, can turn people to stone. And I actually think that the anger that she is holding is, um, can be interpreted as righteous um, and can be a guiding force. And we actually need to reinterpret um, anger so that we can and truly own the power of it. So um, she's, she's been hanging around. Um, and so, we'll, that, yeah, that I'm, I've been thinking about her a lot. Um, was there one of your pieces that you kind of wish went differently, like working with it, 
like it didn't go the way you expected, <laughs> but you ended up happy with it in the end? Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll be vulnerable for a moment. Circe upstairs, I think she needs a couple more firings. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited about like layering and um, uh, you know, you can put paint on and fire off and it has its own surface and then you put on glazes and then maybe you put on actually raw clay and um, you can keep kind of playing and layering. So I think, I think she wants to be refined. <laughs> Have you ever thrown away a piece? Well, I think that's every artist's right. To throw that piece, and no one can take it out of the dumpster or the trash. So um, I reserve the right to. Thank you. So we're welcome to take questions from the audience for either the Teen Museum Studies participants or Ruth. Either, either one is open for question. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm wondering, this is a question for the Teen Museum Studies kids, and it doesn't have to be um, the, the panelists, but what were the, your favorite thing about this learning experience or this session or anything that you experienced that you enjoyed? Um, I thought it was really cool to see all the like different artists we got to jury from. There was 15 artists we got to choose from, and they were all based in Missouri. And I thought it was really cool to see all these artists that I'd never heard about, and also like see all the different mediums and um, how they made the pieces and where they've like exhibited at, and all their experience was really cool. I think my favorite part of the process was the elimination process just because like it sparked a lot of conversation and opened a lot of new perspectives and it it just had oh, it made you have a very open mindset to what you were reading and choosing in the audience yeah. i really liked uh <laughs> um i really liked working with everybody and learning about everybody's different tastes and artists what other people thought made an artist very good or very bad or like what they thought should be in a museum. Uh. This is a, a little flip, but what do you think of Barbie? <laughs> She's a Barbie girl. She's in her Barbie world. Um, <laughs> well, I think that um, people are taking their, their images of themselves, they're taking their archetypes, they're taking their um, mythical concepts of femininity and womanhood, and they're not going to get rid of it. They're going to re-own it. So that's enough. They're going to reinvent it. Any last questions for our group? OK, great. Thank you. Coming. <laughs> um, we are great believers in arts as a vital part of education for young people. And this morning, I was listening to uh, the New Yorker Radio Hour in an interview with Spike Lee. And they asked him, um, they were asking him about how he got into the arts and what his family was like. And so there was a great quote from him. I can get it to come up here. He said, a lot of times when it comes to the arts, parents kill their children's dreams. 
So <laughs> as people who have come as far as you have, Ruth, and how you young people are moving forward, and how you, I'm sorry, I talk with my hands, and how you all are, are moving forward with your arts um, interests and career, I just wondered uh, you know, how you felt about that and parental influence. Well, I think it's very interesting being an educator because um, teachers, professors, guides, educators, um, they are professionals and experts in their field. So in a sense, um, you have to, to some degree, offer some trust. Trust to the educator, trust to your child, trust to your adolescent. Um, trust to yourself as a parent. Um, I think so often as parents, we want the perfect experience for our child or our adolescent and actually stumbling a little bit, engaging your shadow side, experimenting. Those are all scary concepts for parents, but they're essential to art. Um, so we have to create a space for that um, in your parenting practice or in your teaching practice. Do you guys have any thoughts on? Um, I feel like I feel like the quote is can be like very true because I feel like you look up as a child you look up to your parents and you are kind of influenced by them and. You know, if, you know, your parents kind of kill your dreams, <laughs> then, like, I feel like you can kind of, like, you won't try to, like, if they say, oh, no, this is, like, stupid, then you kind of just, like, you know, try to back away from it, and you kind of, like, agree with them, because they're your parents. But also, it could be something very important to you, and I feel like that the quote can be very true, and that... I feel like that has happened, like some people I've known, like that, that's happened to a ton of people. Um, I'm very fortunate. My mom has always supported me through my art and uh, this journey. I feel like the thing that has always brought me down through art is myself and the internet. Because you compare yourself constantly to other people, other grown adults and stuff uh, who have had way more experience. and. Uh, I feel like the majority, when people are looking down at their art, it's from the people that are closest to them that like hurts the most. When you see somebody on the internet say like, oh, that art sucks or something, and it doesn't hurt as bad when a parent or like a sibling or something and comments on that's bad art, like then you might just give it all up. I feel that if you're, well, art related, if it gets shut down, that you'll find another way to include it into something else, whether it be cleaning your room or decorating your room. It just comes naturally in a different area. So I was afraid to ask this because I came in late and thought maybe you already told us. So tell us about yourself, um, the students that are asking the questions. What kind of art do you do? And I would love, I'm an educator, so I'd love to know where you go to school, if you don't mind. Um, I work with a ton of different uh, mediums in art. I've done sculpting. I've, I'm really wanting to start oil painting. Um, that's my new goal. But I go to St. Joseph's Academy. I work with different types of mediums. Like, I love to draw. I love to paint. I'm good with, like, whatever. And yeah, I just like really like to expand my knowledge on art. So yeah. Um, I go to SLHN Homeschool Network. Uh, I really like to work with watercolor and digital. Um, I like to experiment with a lot of stuff. I'm really into sculptures and clay. I work with that a lot. Um, and I also work with watercolor on sculptures because I really like the interesting effect that it does kind of like leaks down and drips all over it and it really makes like an explosion of color uh, so I like 
tons of different uh, styles. Okay, I go to Rittner High School in St. Anne, I think. I don't know where it's at. But um, I do a lot of pencil drawing, and I like to draw a lot of animals because I feel like they're really detailed, and that just says a lot about me. I love animals, specifically turtles. Um, and yeah, I do love watercolor, but it's really hard to use. So I'm working on that right now, and I've never done any sculpting. I don't know why. Well, I think on our note of our young people sharing about what they love to do, we'll just end with love for you for being here. Thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. And thank you, Ruth, very much for sharing your art with us, and hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.